So Japan has not been part of this story so far. I skipped Japan, <coughs> well, one, because we don't have time for yet another civilization. But also because Japan really imported a lot from China in the old days. So you study China, <coughs> and you get a feeling of what went on in Japan. Like Japan got uh, Buddhism through China, uh, initially just about the same schools, and um, even its uh, written language, the characters are from China. Um, <coughs> And then it, uh, it went through a period that, that compares with the European Middle Ages. You know, the, the, you've seen the movies of, with the samurais and uh, you know, the, there was anarchy. It was really a very anarchic period. Uh, <clears throat> something happens um, at this point, uh, towards the end of the 19th century, that will uh, dramatically change the way Japan behaves and the way it is perceived abroad. And um, <clears throat> that's called the major restoration. It's, it's, it's a long story, but they restored the power of the official emperor of Japan that for a while had just been a figurehead. So in theory, that's the restoration of Japanese values. But in practice, that uh, starts um, a a revolution in the way Japan uh, works. Um, there was a, a study published in 1869 uh, that publicized the fact that the West was way ahead of Japan. And that really started a whole new way of thinking. Of course, China at that point also knew that the West was, a, was ahead. At that point, China had already lost uh, uh, at least one major war against the, the Western powers. But China's reaction was still to consider the West as barbarians. Uh, Japan's reaction was different. We want to learn from the West. That became a totally new attitude. So they sent uh, students to the US, uh, invited teachers to Japan, invited generals you know, to advise about the army. So it was a completely different idea. It was the idea, <coughs> uh, we are restoring our, officially we are restoring our, our, our traditional values. But in practice, we would really like to learn how the West did it. And so that actually, that major restoration becomes actually a, a progress of rapid Westernization. In fact, even the pictures, I think I have pictures here of the founders of the big companies, the company that eventually becomes Mitsubishi and Toyota and so on. Uh, <clears throat> you see their parents dressed in traditional Japanese costume and then suddenly suit and tie, suddenly the Western uh, clothes. So the West replaces China as Japan's main role model. And yet they even have uh, a constitutional revolution in 1889. Um, they invade China in 1894, which is what the Europeans were doing, you know, colonial uh, invasions. Then they strike an alliance with Britain. That's the first military pact between a Western power <coughs> and uh, a Far Eastern power. And then in 1904, as I, as I mentioned, there's a war with Russia, and the result of the war is that Japan wins. You know, Europeans were winning everywhere against non-Europeans. This is a case, the first case, where actually an Asian nation uh, beat a European uh, power. And that really changed the psychology of Japan. Japan started seeing itself as the one country that can stop the invasion, the European invasion. <clears throat> and then, uh, fast forward, in World War I, there was smart enough to side with the countries that would win the war. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so it's... Um, it's exactly the opposite of what China did. China continued to think of itself as the Middle Kingdom, as the most advanced uh, nation in the world. And uh, Japan had, uh, uh, honestly, didn't have those great dynasties. Uh, you know, the Han, the Tang, uh, the Song. Japan didn't have that. So by definition, it didn't have as much to be proud of. But its attitude was different. Uh, 
my past was not that great the Western powers achieved something I wasn't able to, I want to copy. And uh, out of this they also had their own uh, industrialization and they always also had uh, uh, the big corporations phenomenal. And that's uh, what I uh, was mentioned. Uh, some of them came from merchant families, some of them came from samurais, some of them came from peasants and they founded uh, the early generation of Zaibatsu, you know, the big Japanese corporation that works in many, is active in many different fields. Um, China, <coughs> meanwhile, was uh, uh, collapsing, uh, was uh, going from, uh, from one crisis to the next one. Uh, the first major rebellion was the Taiping Rebellion in uh, the city of Nanjing, uh, Overall, in those uh, 14 years, they estimate 30 million died. And uh, there was uh, <coughs> a sign that the emperor was losing control over some of the provinces. Uh, <coughs> uh, the British ended up controlling uh, Shanghai uh, and eventually Hong Kong. Uh, and, and other powers began to occupy different parts of China. And as I said, Japan in 1894 uh, conquered a piece of China. Um, <clears throat> then I had another rebellion, then another rebellion, a famine, uh, was the Opium Wars, <clears throat> then the Opium Wars against Britain. Um, and the, 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 the dynasty at that point was a Manchu uh, dynasty, and uh, that did not help. Uh, in 1861, the new emperor was five years old, so power was in the hands of the regent, his mother, Jixi, and that uh, was not, uh, probably not as smart as the empress ever. Um, when this uh, child, which at this point is a teenager, dies, uh, he, the, he succeeded by his uh, three-year-old cousin, so again, the range of mother remains in power. So that didn't help. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's the Opium War. So in 1860, they also fight the Opium War against uh, Britain. It's kind of interesting that in those days, the Western powers were forcing people to use drugs. You know, when the Chinese emperor said he wanted to ban opium, uh, Britain started the war. It's like the United States banning uh, heroin and Afghanistan attacking the United States to punish the United States for that one. Okay. <coughs> um, then they lost against uh, France and Japan and so on and so on. And uh, so by the end, uh, by the end of the century, that's what you have. China is divided into spheres of influence. The emperor has lost control of some of the provinces. Um, <coughs> so if you compare what was going on in China, what was going on in Japan, it's kind of interesting. Uh, totally different directions. Right? First of all, China started, if you go back a couple of centuries, China was so much ahead of Japan. You know, that civilization had invented so much. Uh, they had created a government of uh, uh, meritocracy. The scholar official you know, was a hierarchy based on uh, how smart, intelligent, and knowledgeable you are. And instead, guess what? Things changed dramatically. So the, the thing in China, first of all, Western ideas always viewed uh, with suspicion pretty much until, uh, until uh, uh, well, even before Mao. But Mao, people don't realize Mao was a Marxist. Marx was German. You know, there was a major thing that uh, the leader of China is inspired by European. <coughs> but at this point, until this point, China has seen everything from the West either useless or evil. That's been the perspective. Um, China has never been, uh, uh, throughout its history, history, industrialized. Again, we can speculate. One possibility, lots of available, easily available, cheap labor, so you don't need to industrialize. Um, and they're still reluctant to industrialize at this point, while Europe is industrializing like crazy and Japanese. Um, the only cities that expand rapidly at that point are the ones controlled by foreigners and to this day Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hong Kong are the big, uh, big industrial uh, cities in, uh, in China. 
the railways built mostly by foreign powers, bank communications built by foreign powers. So the Chinese really did not uh, welcome any of what was going on in, in, uh, in Europe, or the industrial financial uh, revolution was going on in, in Europe. They're perfectly happy with the agricultural society, transportation mostly by water, they have the great canals built centuries earlier. You know. Japan is the opposite attitude. You know, the Western the Western powers are doing something right, I want to do the same thing. <coughs> Well, what happens later, and eventually the young uh, Chinese start realizing that Japan is ahead of China. That must have been a cultural shock. <laughs> Japan is ahead of us? That doesn't make sense. Well, then the, ch the young Chinese intellectuals uh, will cause the collapse of that Manchu dynasty with the revolution of 1911. And uh, those intellectuals were actually inspired by Japan, which is kind of interesting. They went to Japan to study. So Japan was obviously ahead of China. Its own intellectuals were going to Japan. Yeah, the revolution of 1911 is largely organized in Japan and by young people, students, who replaced the scholar <coughs> class as political leaders. Now, that, that revolution didn't go too well. That's, uh, yeah, Sun Yat sen revolution. Um, he won, but it, it Within one year, it was uh, removed by a military dictator, and China actually got even weaker, more messy, and uh, even bigger trouble. But Sun Yat-sen, that's why I was hesitating to, see, to say Mao, because Sun Yat-sen already was taking a lot of ideas from the West and from Japan. So it was a major change in the way China, at least the intellectuals of China, perceived the nation. So in Japan, nationalism, the fact that we want to build a great nation, leads to an industrial and financial boom. <clears throat> and the anti-European sentiment, anti-imperialist sentiment, actually yields to the desire to build their own empire. Yeah, imperialism is bad when the Europeans do, but it works, so now we want to do it. In China, nationalism leads to an intellectual debate and eventually to Marxism totally different uh, trajectory and uh, uh, and the anti-imperialist the anti-imperialist really means anti-european sentiment eventually leads to anti-capitalist uh, sentiment so different views uh, they both experience the same penetration of european power uh, but the reaction is totally different japan basically tries to learn for better and for worse both in terms of learning how to develop an industry and in terms of how to develop an empire. China still refuses to, to learn until it's too late, until anything they do, uh, until they are ready to uh, oppressed by the West and, uh, and, and, and the options uh, are not as, uh, um, as favorable. Uh, to be honest, China is a much bigger country. So, <coughs> uh, the major restoration in Japan uh, was easier to implement than a, an equivalent uh, revolution in, uh, in China. <coughs> anyway, the other emerging country, uh, in, it's in Europe and it's uh, Germany. So this is not a coincidence. Eventually you know what happens in World War II. Japan and Germany, the two emerging powers, would be protagonists in uh, both. Right? So Germany has been unified uh, thanks to that war that Prussia once again won against France and again, as I said, Prussia won because it, it was better educated and uh, industrialized than France. Okay. If you had lived back then, you would have bet your money on France. Bigger, more people in the army, actually Prussia won. <clears throat> and then uh, Bismarck was smart enough to use that uh, war to unify Germany pretty much under Prussia because the capital was Berlin and that was the capital of Prussia. Anyway, they beat first Austria and then France. As I said, Austria was the big uh, German-speaking uh, country, was really the empire. Okay, so they're doing a number of good things. I mean, first of all, I already mentioned last time, they introduced what now is the PhD, the idea that you do research in university. Yes. You don't just go to learn a trade, you go to learn as much theory as possible as is available. 
And then there were the first welfare state. They introduced sickness insurance, disability insurance, retirement, and so on. <coughs> Uh, they started the colonial empire, they could not compete with France and uh, Britain at that point, they were late comers, but they did get uh, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, what is now Namibia, islands in the Pacific Ocean, a right? piece of New Guinea maybe was also German, you know, uh, maybe Togo in uh, Africa also. Anyway, long economic boom, long economic boom, they are the second industrial power after Britain uh, uh, by the end of the Victorian age, World War I. <coughs> um, and Berlin is the electrical city. Electricity has become a big thing in Germany um, and a lot of the inventions I mentioned actually came from, uh, uh, from Germany. So the first practical uh, dynamo, the first electric railway, the first electric elevator, the first electric tram system, uh, lots of the things that uh, became uh, the AC, the alternating current motor and generator, uh, a lot of these things came from uh, German inventors and German companies and Siemens and AEG were the two big uh, uh, electronic, uh, electrical uh, corporations in Europe. <coughs> And German universities were leading. So in a, in a few slides, uh, you will see quantum mechanics and relativity. They were born in Germany. Not a coincidence. Germany at this point had uh, the best universities. And because Germany had been, uh, until 1870, had been split in all those city-states, unlike England and France, where the great universities were really concentrated in one area, in Germany, they, they spread all over the now, all over the nation, and that will remain until today. That had an advantage that, that they had local universities in many different places. Um, <coughs> so physics, investment in physics, chemistry, um, and then Siemens, AEG, and later Bayer, they start the factory laboratory. They have their own laboratory. So there was a lot of uh, uh, applied and uh, uh, theoretical research going on in, in, uh, in Germany. Yeah. So anyway, so United States, uh, Japan, France, um, yeah, France also because of the cars came, uh, the early cars came from uh, France and um, and Germany. So that. There's something going on, it, and that's why they call it the second industrial revolution, because steel replaces iron. Steel has a lot of advantages, besides the fact that we learn a cheap way to make it in a huge quantities. And you wouldn't have skyscrapers without steel, and you wouldn't have such long railways without steel. So steel is a major component. Electricity slowly replaces steam. I say slowly because in the 1920s, you still had a lot of factories in the United States that were steam-powered, but it's slowly coming, coming out. Why it takes a while, as usual, the infrastructure. Today, we are so used that every house has a power socket. But when, when Edison uh, <coughs> first built the first power plant, people had to physically custom build, uh, you know, carry a cable to their factory. Uh, so today we take for granted the, the electrical infrastructure, but back then it wasn't. And as I said, Edison made, made a mistake investing in DC current that is really hard to transport. Uh, the Germans uh, focused on the AC, eventually the United States also got AC. So it took a while, but the electricity, electricity was beginning to replace steam. And machines in general were replacing humans, and this started in different ways. In uh, Britain it was in the textile industry, in, uh, the United States it was in agriculture, but at the end of the day there's more and more machines uh, doing, um, uh, carrying out functions uh, traditionally uh, reserved for humans or animals. <coughs> um, then you have more and more scientific laboratories and uh, transportation communication have, been, have become very important uh, for business. <coughs> and it does help that Britain, France, eventually uh, also Germany and Japan 
uh, are imperial powers because you can get resources from different places very quickly. You know, uh, the first industrial revolution in uh, in Britain relied on uh, iron imported from Sweden. Uh, now Britain is the empire. Whatever they need, there's a place where where they can find it. So that's changing the world. <coughs> and uh, now that's the beginning, really. The, today we. I hear so many people say, oh, progress is so rapid uh, in our age. Progress is so rapid back then that I don't have enough slides to show you how much happened at that point. You know, between 1880 and 1920, it's mind-boggling. I mean, eventually we'll get to the point where we are inventing the car, the plane, the radio, all of them within 20 years. You know, it's, the, the world changes dramatically. Anyway, briefly, biology. That's when biology becomes a science, you know, they, they start discovering what the first thing, Louis Pasteur, is another great one. Because he, he is the one who convinced everybody diseases are caused by germs. It's not because you have bad karma. It's not because God decided to punish you. It's <coughs> there's germs. Now that, that's a fundamental thing. And then it doesn't take a lot of time for people to start isolating the causes of all these diseases that have been around for a long time and uh, the first vaccine. And the, the, when I understand syphilis, that's not a detail actually, uh, because there was, by, by, by the way, there was very widespread. There was a major disease that's gone away. But anyway, at this point, they're really discovering the principles of antibiotics and of, of the immune system. You know, they don't know how exactly it works and why it works, but they start realizing things that would become very powerful to save, you know, millions of lives. <coughs> and the microscopes made in Germany. <coughs> Chemistry, Faraday, same guy who was so <coughs> uh, <coughs> brilliant in uh, electromagnetism, <coughs> he identifies benzene and that's the birth of organic chemistry. And then we start inventing more and more artificial things. <coughs> the first synthetic dye, uh, industrial, industrial chemicals multiply very rapidly, and benzene is one of the main uh, uh, sources of uh, uh, organic chemistry. <coughs> uh, <coughs> the first plastic, aspirin, <coughs> synthetic plastic. So that's, that's, and then the car will also trigger a lot of this. Painting cars will trigger the chemical industry to port would become a big name. <coughs> so chemistry becomes a major industry, not just a curiosity for, uh, uh, for independent inventors working in garage. The agricultural revolution is another big story. Uh, <coughs> it will continue throughout the 20th century. Once you understand that you can use artificial fertilizers, not just horses manure, you can actually make first fertilizer, you understand the principle. <coughs> Then that starts an agricultural revolution. So non -ammonia, originally ammonia, it eventually becomes the number one fertilizer in the world. Uh, and of course the car. And uh, invented where? Germany. Uh, the guys only powered car. Um, and more trains and the first airplane. <coughs> Um, and these things happen so quickly. I mean, uh, that's a thing. So the first airplane, 1903. Uh, that's this another thing. With all of these inventions, you can always find somebody who's done something before. Before mm -hmm. then, there was somebody who flew like you know 200 meters. Mm -hmm. But their flight is longer. Um, <clears throat> and then, look at this. Yeah, like uh, not even 20 years later. For this war, for World War I, France built 67,800 planes, Britain 58,000, Germany 48,000. This is a very recent invention, and it becomes one of the main weapons in World War I, you know, just a few years later. And also cars are the same thing. By the way, radio is the same thing, you know, invented, then within a few years there's hundreds of radio stations. The telephone. <coughs> um, the radio, all of this is 
you can pick your inventor, you know, because there's there's a progress in a, in a, in in the technology. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so you have the telephone, the phonograph, the consumer camera, um, the record, um, cinema, magnetic recording. So all of this invented in a very brief period of time. So anybody who tells me that now we are living in an age of dramatic progress, I remind them that in that, you know, those 20 years, what you had, people started flying. Mm -hmm. uh, you could hear the voice of your mother thousands of kilometers away. You could hear the voice of somebody who's dead in the record. Uh, these were mind-boggling things. It was bordering magic, you know, it all happened in 20 years. Plus transportation, plus the fact you could go from A to B uh, at 10 times the speed of the old days, and the cinema showing you things that don't exist. Uh, made in a studio, the camera taking a picture of you. You know, we we are so used to the idea that you can you have sound that you can store sound of in the images. But if you go back, the only thing you could you could store faithfully, more or less faithfully, was writing. You know, everything else, a painting was a painting, and uh, statue was a statue. But now I can take a picture of you. So anybody who tells me that today there's a lot of progress, I send them back to study this age, where in 20 years a lot of things happen. And that's just the beginning. I don't know if I have slides for skyscrapers. <coughs> um, yeah, so air, airplanes, trains, steamships, telegraph, telephone, so major revolution, both in transportation and communication. How much knowledge transfer or sharing was there between Europe and the US during these periods? A lot. Yeah, just because, because of Immigration between the two countries, or once they've had that ability to communicate well, via phone, or yeah, were there yeah, scientific so, so journals? Communications uh -huh. and immigration. A mm -hmm. lot of the inventions in the United States came directly and directly from Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, in those days, <clears throat> I don't want to criticize the laws of intellectual property, mm -hmm. but in those days, things were looser. You wouldn't keep a secret, you know, the way you do today. You would actually do the opposite. Marconi boasted, we still don't know how much of these original claims were true. He told everybody, look what yeah. I've done. You know, today Apple keeps it secret until the very last second. You know? <laughs> so it was also a different way. So people were very proactive in spreading uh, ideas. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, just uh, the world had changed in terms of connecting, uh, at least uh, Western Europe and the United States that were very uh, tightly connected at that point. <clears throat> well, the other thing that um, I didn't list here was paid, but think of skyscrapers. Think the way cities changed back then. Now, once you invent the electrical elevator, you can build the really high buildings that totally changed the, the concept of the city. And in Los Angeles, they were changing, they were invented suburbia. So in those 20 years, it's incredible how many things changed uh, in the world. So I, I, I really find it difficult to compare. I don't know if the internet, the computer plus the internet plus the smartphone really compares with the fact that now people are flying, you can hear the voice of your mother a thousand kilometers mm -hmm. away, uh, you can hear the voice of somebody who's dead, and that's, uh, you know. Anyway. Um, Science was actually not leading, <laughs> was actually uh, following uh, industrial developments. Think of thermodynamics. There's three major, well, four with the electromagnetism, which I removed because it's too technical. But there's four major uh, scientific disciplines that are born at this point. I mean, Newton, uh, Newton did mechanics, you know, terrestrial mechanics and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, astral mechanics. But then Maxwell did electromagnetism. Maxwell at one point figured out the exact equa equations of the electromagnetic field. Uh, <coughs> they were using steam engines, but they didn't really know why it worked until the thermodynamics, thermodynamics came out with the, with the equations. And then you will have uh, uh, quantum mechanics and uh, relativity. Okay? These are four new things that were not in Newton's uh, uh, in Newton's equations. 
what is different what is different for each one. So with Maxwell, actually I should have read Maxwell, because with Maxwell you have the field. It's, it's, uh, the electron is not just a particle, it's a field, he didn't even know the electron. It's a field, he had the right idea. It's fields, when, uh, when, the, when you have an electrical phenomenon, it means two fields are interacting and doing something. So you, you start, you move from thinking about an object to thinking about a field in space. Uh, and by the way, he explained light that way. Light is an electromagnetic field, you know, radiation. Um, thermodynamics, um, <coughs> what is special about thermodynamics? Well, everybody knows entropy these days, the concept of entropy. Um, but in general, it's a study of uh, something that with Newton's physics is really hard to study. Millions of particles interacting at incredible speed. That's what steam is. That's what any gas is. Any gas is millions of particles interacting at very high speed. Theoretically, you could write million equations in Newton's physics and try to understand what happens next. In practice, it's not feasible. It's just too complicated. So you have to use a different kind of thinking. That's what is different about thermodynamics. You have to study, you have to study populations. So the quantities that come out of, uh, uh, of thermodynamics are actually averages. Temperature is a, measure, is a measure of the average activity of all the particles inside the thing that you are measuring. Mm -hmm. And so it's a different way of thinking. You know, it's really about populations and not individual objects. <coughs> And it is uh, very dynamic. You know, thermodynamics was born to understand machines that do work. Classical physics was born to understand simple, simpler things. There's an initial state, there's an end state. How do I go from here to here? How much energy I had here? I measure how much speed was here, how much speed was here, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, with thermodynamics, it's more about what happens in between. You know, classical physics is the being Thermodynamics is the becoming, what happens in between. And in doing that, some interesting things happen. One of the fundamental laws of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy, which Galileo already knew. You know, energy eventually is conserved. In the case of thermodynamics, by the way, it's better to talk about work, because that's what it was designed to explain. So anyway, work changes the nature of energy. You can have initially electrical energy that then causes some movement, so it becomes mechanical energy, fine. Overall, you conserve energy. But one thing that was obvious uh, from the beginning was uh, <coughs> you can't do it forever. Okay? There's something that gets lost. Energy is conserved, but something gets lost in the process. You can't have machines that work forever. Uh, the perpetual motion is not possible. What is lost? It's the quality of the energy. You can have electrical into mechanic and mechanic doing something else and something else, but eventually you get to a point where the energy is not usable anymore. There's something that gets lost as you transform energy.